Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president of Stony Brook University, Dr. Samuel L. Stanley, Jr. Thank you so much, everybody, and, and thank you for coming today, particularly. On such a beautiful day, actually, to come inside. I really appreciate it. Um, before I start my remarks, I wanted to say that one of the things I'm really grateful for is the positive relationships that Stony Brook has with our elected officials, who represent and support the university's endeavors on so many different levels. And I'm very pleased that some of, the, some of them are able to join us today. Please welcome, as he's walking in right now, New York State Assemblyman Steve Engelbright. Steve? <laughs> welcome. New York State Assemblyman Michael Fitzpatrick. Mike, always good to see you. Suffolk County Legislator, Kara Hahn. Kara. <laughs> Brookhaven Town Councilwoman, Valerie Cartwright. Valerie, welcome. <laughs> Melanie Senezzi, representing Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. Melanie, thank you. <laughs> and Lisa Santoramo, representing Suffolk County Executive Steve Ballone. Lisa, welcome. We also have members of the Stony Brook Council in attendance, very important contributors to this university. I wanted to welcome Frank Trotta. Frank. <laughs> Newly appointed member of the Stony Brook Council, Christopher Hahn. Chris, <laughs> welcome. And I don't know if she's made it here yet, but we're expecting her, Linda Arman, as well. Is Linda here? <laughs> I don't see her, but, but we'll applaud. So, Again, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here, dispense with the written speech. I'm actually just going to talk for this one as opposed to my previous uh, four years or five years, depending on you count it, doing this. Um, but I want to begin, as we always do, uh, with the welcoming uh, of our new faculty. So if all new faculty are here, would please rise. All new faculty are here today. Rise. I'm not going to make you give an oath or anything. You can, you can, you can sit down. Um, but I just wanted to say how pleased I am that all of you decided to join Stony Brook U University and our community of scholars. Um, you're an extraordinarily distinguished group. You come from a number of different places uh, in your academic careers. Uh, and you, of course, represent a number of disciplines at the university as well. But I, one thing I think I know that you all share is a commitment to excellence in your educational and academic scholarship uh, endeavors. And we appreciate that at Stony Brook, and we're very glad that you decided to bring your talents to our university. On behalf of the administration, I can tell you that we are absolutely committed to your success at the university. We will work very hard to make sure you have absolutely the most productive career you can uh, at Stony Brook University. So again, welcome to each and every one of you. So, I want to begin by welcoming some new members of my senior leadership team. We are very fortunate to recruit Sean Hilbrun um, from Oregon State University to do, be our new athletic director. Sean, are you here? There he is. Yep. Welcome, Sean. Already doing a great job. I wanted to introduce you to Dr. Edward Summers, who's chief deputy to the president. Eddie came to us from Union College, also with his energy and enthusiasm already having an impact. Eddie, where are you? In the very important role as director for Title IX and risk management, Marjorie Leonard, who is serving as interim, has agreed to be the new director for Title IX and risk management. Please join me in welcoming Marjorie. Before I talk about the next person, I want to digress for a minute and make a point. Advancement is so extraordinarily important to Stony Brook University. In fact, I think it's more important now than it's ever been in any time in our history. It goes across all of the activities on campus. Advancement is engaged in student scholarships, really an important part of the source for student scholarships. It's involved in our capital projects. We have buildings on campus that were built solely by private donation. We also have some buildings now that are built by a combination of state dollars as well as private dollars. So philanthropy is important in any capital project we look at undergoing. It also plays a key role in the support of faculty and their research. 
Through endowed professorships, it allows us to recruit and retain the best faculty. And we also have developed programs through advancement to directly support the research of our faculty, so a vital role there. And finally, of course, our alumni are, ex are an incredibly important resource for Stony Brook University, and advancement plays the primary role in dealing with our alumni. We've seen tremendous growth in advancement um, over, since 2011 to 2014, just really the past three years. We've had almost 20,000 new donors to the university during that time who've given more than $58 million. We've achieved more than $357 million during that time in commitments and outright gifts. And we'd be able to create 35 new endowed professorships at Stony Brook University during that time. Campus-wide, this is a great slide that comes from the annual report um, from the Advancement Department, but it shows you that we've had a 61% endowment growth, but also gives you an idea of all the areas that are touched upon by advancement, and they are legion. So in view of the incredibly important role of advancement to Stony Brook University, as well as in the fact that we are about to undergo the most comprehensive fundraising campaign in the university's history, it's my pleasure to announce that Dexter Bailey has been promoted from Vice President for Advancement to Senior Vice President for Advancement. Please join me in congratulating Dexter. Dexter, all right. Congratulations to you. Dexter joins, Dexter joins uh, Ken Kashansky, Dennis Asanis, and Barbara Chernow as the three other Senior Vice Presidents at Stony Brook University. This is an outstanding leadership team, and I look forward to working with each and every one of them, as well as all of you, as we continue to move the university forward. I wanted to acknowledge our new Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, Sasha Kopp. Sasha, where are you? There he is. A distinguished scholar um, from the University of Texas, Austin, but also a skilled administrator, and Sasha is already having a very major impact on the university. Chuck Tabor, who you all know as Dean of the Graduate School, has accepted another role, which is responsibility for School of Professional Development. Chuck, please rise if you're here. And again, thank you very much for your contributions. Two people who were important appointments that the provost, Dennis Asanis, made. Nancy Goroff, the associate provost for the integration of research education and professional development, and dean of the graduate school, has a number of responsibilities you can see, but one of the most important ones is shepherding our postdocs. Nancy, are you here? There she is. And then enrollment is a vital part of the university's apparatus. Rodney Morrison has become the associate provost for enrollment and retention management. Rodney. Please join me in welcoming Rodney. Over at Stony Brook Medicine, two critical appointments. One is Jim Murray as the Chief Information Officer at Stony Brook Medicine. I welcome Jim here. Please join me in welcoming Jim. And then Sam Naru as the Chair of Radiation Oncology. Again, please join me in welcoming him as well. So these are new additions to the team. There are many others listed in your book, as well as a list of the new faculty. Uh, fantastic growth in the faculty, as well as administration. And I think each person is making important contributions. Three people who are serving as interim roles for the university, which are very important. David Conover as interim vice president for research. David is in Washington, DC right now, doing work for DOE. But let's applaud him in absentee. <laughs> Eamon Cow, serving as Interim Dean for International Academic Programs and Services. Eamon, are you here today? There he is. Thank you, Eamon. Last but certainly not least, Mary Trular is Interim Dean of the School of Dental Medicine. And Mary, thank you. So, our faculty had a number of successes in this past year, and we always enjoy celebrating them. One was Jim Simons, uh, his election to the National Academy of Sciences for his seminal work in mathematics. Patricia Wright won the Indianapolis Prize, the highest prize in conservation. Three of the six finalists from the Indianapolis Prize were Stony Brook University faculty. Patricia Wright was the winner of the $250,000 Indianapolis Prize, and we're very proud of her. The first breakthrough prize in mathematics, first breakthrough prizes in mathematics were awarded. Um, Sir Simon Donaldson, a new recruit to the Simon Center for Geometry and Physics, was the recipient of that prize. It is a $3 million prize uh, given by the Breakthrough Prize of Mathematics. So again, a wonderful accomplishment for Sir Simon Donaldson and for Stony Brook University. The Pulitzer Prize from Drama, 
for Annie Baker, a member of our uh, graduate arts faculty uh, in Southampton. American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Ken Dill from the Lawfer Center, and Jules Pfeiffer, also associated with the graduates program in Southampton. For the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Jim Bliska, Laszlo Mahali, and Diana Padilla, all recipients, again, very prestigious, and we're very proud of them. Guggenheim Fellows, Mark Aronoff in linguistics, Bill Chedek in religious studies, and Eva Kate in philosophy. Again, seminal honors for them and for the university. SUNY distinguished professors, Vitaly Sitovsky, Robert Harvey, and Ken Kashansky. Again, one of the premier honors that SUNY does, actually the premier honor that SUNY grants for faculty. And distinguished service professor, Patricia Wright, distinguished teaching professor, now retired, but all of us know, Michael Schwartz. And again, please join me now in congratulating all of these faculty <laughs> for their achievements. Two other awards, Fulbright for Lawrence Froman in history, Morningside Gold Medal for Applied Mathematics for David Gu. Again, my congratulations to them. And then listed here were five outstanding students who won the distinguished awards that you see here. Uh, and we particularly have focused in the past on Neha Kanarawala, who was our first Gates Cambridge Scholar. This is just a small sample of the outstanding awards that our students uh, have achieved and received and really is a testimony to the incredible lives that our students leave, lead, not only in their academic realm in the classroom, but outside the classroom as well. And I'm really proud of all of their accomplishments. <laughs> and our student athletes uh, had tremendous success last year. I want to particularly point out Olivia Byrne, who was one of uh, five uh, scholar athletes, uh, scholar athletes of the year uh, from Stony Brook University in the America East Conference number of other awards as well. Um, our student athletes participated and won six conference championships. They had five bids uh, to the NCAA tournament because of that. But I think the most important thing, and probably the thing I'm most proud of, is the cumulative GPA of our student athletes was 3.02, and that's spectacular. So please join me in congratulating them. I know it's a high priority for Sean to keep us there, and, and we will do that. So. All of these accomplishments have led to coverage in the news. Um, Stony Brook has been in the news both through our faculty achievements as well through our student achievements. And this is just a brief summary of some of the many news stories that featured our faculty and students over the past year. So our distinction is being recognized by the outside world. This is a story that we didn't feature there, but was one that I think was all of us were very excited to read about, I'm sure which was the $25 million gift from Jim and Marilyn Simon and the Simons Foundation uh, for the Simons Center for Geometry and Physics. Um, this brings to a total of $105 million the contributions that Jim and Marilyn have made to the Simons Center for Geometry and Physics. This is the world leading center that studies the interface between geometry and physics, has expertise in theoretical physics like string theory. I mentioned before the quality of the people who are being uh, brought in to be members of the center, which includes Sir Simon Donaldson, as I talked about. World class, very proud of it, and we really appreciate Jim and Marilyn's uh, dedication to this uh, remarkable center. So, one thing you didn't see in that news, but I think is really important, is that Stony Brook University is growing. And we're growing in a number of ways, and I wanted to feature some of that as we move forward. First of all, the new faculty. So, we welcome this year. 181 new faculty to Stony Brook University. That's one of the highest totals we've ever had. As I mentioned before, they're in multiple disciplines. Um, they represent, they are hired across East and West campus um, through all areas of the university. But again, we look forward to very positive contributions for each of these new faculty members. And as I'll talk about in a second, the faculty we've hired over the past few years are already making very significant contributions to the growth of our university. We also had our largest class ever enroll at Stony Brook University in terms of first year students. We had 2,856 students uh, enroll. In the past, we'd been at around 2,700, so that's a significant growth for us. Um, but we did it without, uh, without sacrificing quality. So you can see we had 33,000 applications um, for those spots. 
So we continue to do very well uh, in attracting students to apply to the university. Uh, and the quality of the ones we accepted is amazing. 92.8 GPA, 1253 uh, SAT score. People tell me all the time when I meet alums from 10 or 20 years ago, I don't think I could get into Stony Brook today, uh, they always say to me. And I always say, yes, you're right. Um, no, I, I, that's, that's, it's not true. That's not what I say, actually. Always tell them that, of course, they could. Um, but it, it really is a remarkable improvement in quality. And we, these are outstanding students, as I said before, and we're very pleased that they've chosen Stony Brook University for their education. So we've got more faculty. We've got more students. We need more space. So one of the big things on campus has been increasing our facilities to respond to this growth. So everyone knows about the Stony Brook Arena, opening October 1, 2014, going to be a state-of-the-art facility. The Harlem Globetrotters are coming uh, for that opening. I'm going to be there. I, I, I bet many of you will as well. But this is going to be a great uh, venue, uh, great for our students, great for our student athletes, and great for the community as well. Be used for multiple purposes, going to really help our, our campus. Um, a computer science building will be opening in spring 2015. That's a 75,000 square foot building. Computer science, as many of you may know, is one of the best departments at Stony Brook University based on NRC rankings. It's a top flight department. They deserve more space. They're getting more space. And again, we look forward to great things from them uh, as they take possession of this new state of the art building. The pool. So we should have applause, right? OK, it's not done yet. but. We've received the funding um, from the state to finally do the renovations on the pool. You know that very sad story that we were ready to renovate and repair the pool, which was in dire needs of renovations. The state zeroed out critical maintenance dollars from the budget, so we suddenly had no money to do that project. It has sat idle. Many of you have been unhappy, and I'm, I understand completely why you've been unhappy about it. We now have the funds. We have the design. We have the bids in place. Construction will start once we uh, find the, the low bidder and accept them. And we expect opening of a very much improved pool uh, in the spring of 2016. The Medical and Research Translation Building, as well as the hospital uh, pavilion. This is the bed tower, which will, host the, which will house the New Children's Hospital. This is the Medical and Research Translation Building. You've seen the giant hole uh, across the street on East Campus. This is one of the largest projects undertaken uh, in Long Island over the past 20 years or so. More than 400, nearly 450,000 uh, square feet. 450 plus million dollars uh, in cost. Um, but we, it is really going to be transformative for the East Campus and for the university. Um, we are going to have new space both for patients and for research there. And as I said before, I think this is really going to make a difference uh, as we move forward. This was supported in part by philanthropy and also from funds from SUNY 2020 as well. Now, new residence halls and dining facilities. I mentioned we have more students. We need more housing for those students. This is the toll drive facility. It's already, ground is already broken. Again, you've seen large pit there as well. Phase one is under construction right now. That includes a dining facility. Phase two will follow, and we expect completion of phase one in summer of 2016. Completion of phase two, we hope sometime in the fall, but might be slightly later. Uh, of summer of, uh, of 2016 as well. This will add 700 plus beds essentially to our capacity, making a difference in our ability to house and meet the demand uh, at Stony Brook. So, and finally, the Stony Brook Union. Uh, this is a seminal building uh, for our campus, hub for student activity. Uh, it's falling apart. It needs to be renovated. It needs a, a really a massive renovation. That is now on our schedule. We hope to have design completed for that in fall of 2016. There's a lot of logistics associated with remodeling this building, but we expect to be able to get it done. So overall on campus, we have 843,000, nearly 844,000 square feet of construction and renovation. Total construction costs of nearly uh, $608 million. 2,600 jobs associated with this construction on our campus right now and a number, another 1,200 or so uh, indirect jobs. So this is really important to Long Island's economy. I think we forget about that sometimes, how vital these construction projects are to the regional economy. Um, these are major construction, major investment by the state, as well as our donors, in helping build Stony Brook for the future. So 
I wanted to mention Startup New York as well, because that has to do with our capital plans also. Everyone knows about the Startup New York uh, program, the fact that there are tax-free zones that can be set up next to campuses, and particularly SUNY campuses, to attract business um, from around the world to relocate um, to New York, as well as to support new companies, startup companies from New York that are adding jobs. And part of the last budget, thanks in large part to the Long Island delegation, $60 million was added to the budget so that Stony Brook University can build a new building on our R&D park, what we're calling the Innovation Discovery Center, uh, the IDC building. Um, that will be a mezzanine building designed to house companies that have graduated from our incubator, as well as more advanced companies that want to locate in and take advantage of Startup New York. We're very excited about that building. We're working on the design uh, phase now, but it'll really help us accommodate the tremendous de demand for Startup New York. We have seven companies already uh, that are, uh, we're waiting for word for on ESD for their approval for Startup New York. Um, they will be housed in buildings, existing buildings on campus right now, because we don't have, of course, any other uh, new buildings to put them in. But once this new building comes, I think it'll greatly improve our ability to attract great companies to uh, Stony Brook. So as we build all these new buildings, it's very important to emphasize that we continue to focus on being green. All of these buildings will be LEED certified. All the new buildings built on campus will meet LEED certification. We're committed to that. And in addition, through all of the efforts we do on campus, and I commend Barbara Chernow uh, and her team, uh, particularly in this, uh, we will continue to aspire, as we did last year, to be at the top of the honor roll. So we have the highest score possible on the honor roll from the Princeton uh, Review um, for Green Colleges. And again, so please join me in congratulating the people who helped make that possible. So all of this growth has been fueled by an increase in revenue. You can't grow, essentially, without the dollars to do it. And I just wanted to point out that we have now reached a total budget annually of about $2.4 billion for Stony Brook University. That's up from about 1.7 in change uh, when I first came. Um, there's been growth in all of our sectors. The most growth probably has been in the hospital, and I congratulate Ken and Reuven and their team um, for the work they've done to help make this possible. Um, we've had significant growth, though, on the West Campus as well and also growth in the HSC and the affiliated schools, schools of medicine and the affiliated schools. So all this growth, as I said before, is associated with the expansion and improvement, I think, on our campus. And this is a very positive sign that our revenue continues to increase. Not every campus um, can say that. So I think the state of the university is very strong. I think we've made tremendous progress uh, in a number of areas. As I look at it now as in my sixth year at Stony Brook University, um, I would say we may be at, one of, at the best place we've been uh, since I arrived in terms of our finances, in terms of the growth of new faculty, in terms of our ability to attract great students. All of those things, I think, bode incredibly well for Stony Brook University's future. Um, I could stop right now and say the state of the university is great and leave, but I'll tell you about a few challenges that I see coming forward that I think we need to deal with and some ways I think we might address them. So, first challenge I want to talk about very quickly is state support. So as you know, when SUNY 2020 was passed, there was a maintenance of effort clause put into SUNY 2020 that said essentially the state would not cut our budget over the next five years. Um, and they haven't. So the state has stuck with that promise, and they have not cut our budget over the period of time of SUNY 2020. We're getting the same state allocation we were at the beginning of SUNY 2020, essentially. And, and that's fantastic. However, when the new contracts were negotiated um, for our unions, pay raises were built into those new contracts. And that's completely appropriate that there should be pay raises built into those new contracts. But in the past, as a matter of course, generally, the governor and the legislature would incorporate the delta of those salary increases into our state allocation. So our state allocation would increase by the number of the, uh, the salary increases. That didn't happen uh, in this past year, so they weren't included uh, this year. So what that means is, is we have about uh, a $9 million gap, essentially, from what we expected to cover the cost of those salary increases. The legislature allocated about $14 million SUNY-wide to help with that gap. Our share of that is about $1 million, so that reduces it for us to about $8 million. 
but it doesn't change the fact that we have to find $8 million now in our budget, essentially, that we hadn't planned for. And of course, what's concerning is this will continue uh, in the next year as well. So as there's a pay raise, pay increase in the next year, also, unless something has changed, we won't have the money to cover those as well. So we're working very hard to deal with that. Um, one of the ways we deal with that, and I'll talk about it in a second, is simply by working harder and harder to reduce the costs we have, to reduce our administrative costs. That's something we do all the time. When we face the huge budget cuts associated with the recession of 2008 and 2009, we responded to those by grossly disproportionately cutting administrative services compared to academic services. The academic side did take a hit. We couldn't avoid it, but it was much less than it would have been if we hadn't cut on the administrative side. But you can only do that trick so much. At some point in time, you squeeze so much you can't get any more uh, water out of that stone. So we have to be very careful as we look at this problem that we're not reducing fundamental services that our students, faculty, and staff uh, need. So that's the challenge we have. We would love to see a legislative solution for this. We would love to see those dollars uh, restored, either in the governor's budget coming forward or as added uh, by the legislature. That would be fantastic to get that state allocation dollars and make up that gap restored in the current budget. And we will be pushing along with all the other SUNY campuses to try and make that happen. Um, but again, this is one challenge I see is dealing with this shortfall. I mentioned before how we deal with these things, and I just wanted to point out that since we implemented Project 50 Forward, which began with the Bain engagement and has now been taken over by our own project management office, uh, in the four years since the launch of Project 50 Forward, we've trimmed almost $35 million on an annual basis, so recurring on an annual basis from our budget. And the vast majority of that is on the administrative side. And that's through attrition, so people are doing more with less. Uh, or, you know, fewer people are doing more essentially for the university and I'm grateful every day for our staff who've been willing to take that on. Uh, we try and do it again, work very hard to make sure there's not a reduction of services, but that's something we've had to do and people have really risen to the occasion. New software has helped us do some of those changes, but additionally through procurement. We've really reduced our procurement costs and a tool, software tool like SciQuest, for example, is also helping us really reduce uh, our costs of procurement. And probably elements like shared services, which some of you have been engaged in, certainly on the administrative side, has also helped us uh, reduce uh, our costs. So we're going to continue to push on this. But as I said before, there's a limit uh, to how much we can do ultimately in this area. I also want to talk about renewing SUNY 2020. So I talked earlier about the extraordinary impact that New York SUNY 2020 has had on Stony Brook. Because of it, we're on a path to hire 254 new faculty. Now, some of those budget cuts might impact that ultimate number, but we're in the process of trying to hire up to 254 new faculty. We've implemented, implemented capital projects like the MART, as I talked about. We've increased student aid and scholarships by $37 million uh, from SUNY 2020 funds. We've expanded academic advising through our academic success program, and that's really critical, as I'll talk about in a second, as we look at our graduation rates. We've hired additional teaching assistants, uh, again, important as we look at students graduating. And we've raised graduate student stipends by $2,000. That's still not enough. We want to raise graduate student stipends even more to be competitive. Chuck is, I'm sure, nodding in agreement. Um, we, we need to do that. Um, but SUNY 2020 helped us take the first steps towards getting more competitive stipends for our graduate students. And as I mentioned before, it also ensured the maintenance of effort clause that's so important for us uh, in doing our budget planning. We would love to see this renewed. We think it's been transformative for Stony Brook. We're in the process of assembling all the data that we want to be able to present to the governor and the legislature that documents the positive impact that SUNY 2020 has had in our campus and on the region. That's going to be very important as we go forward. We know our sister institutions in SUNY uh, will be doing the same thing. We think there's going to be a tremendous collective uh, return from SUNY 2020. We're not going to be able to measure it all in the three or four year period we had, right? There's many students uh, that had an opportunity to graduate from Stony Brook and great experience and become productive members of the workforce that we may not capture. There's investments in research faculty that we've made that we may not capture uh, in the immediate time frame, but we'll capture everything we can to show the positive impact of this program. We would really like to see it extended. So what we would like to ask for, after all, the name is SUNY 2020, so why not extend it? to 2020, right? That makes some sense instead of ending it. Um, so we'd really like to see it extend 
uh, to 2020. That's going to be a difficult legislative ask, I think. I think the cause is right. I think the, the information and support of it will be there. But we'll be asking all of us to work together uh, as we talk about the importance of SUNY 2020 for our campus and SUNY as a whole. I want to talk about graduation rates. And this is something that's very important, I think, to Stony Brook. We're doing a pretty good job on our graduation rates. I would say we're doing a good job on our graduation rates overall. And if you look at Stony Brook's six-year graduation rates, they're pretty much aligned with where one would expect based on the incoming quality of our students we have. So if you, and I'm talking about comparing us to comparable institutions nationally. We're in a good, pretty good place as far as our six-year graduation rates go. We could be a little higher. I wouldn't mind if we were a little higher. I think we should aspire to be higher, and we're, we're going to do that. But an area where we really do lag a little bit is in our four-year graduation rates. And so let me show you that. This is Stony Brook's four-year graduation rates since 2007. So remember, we've continued to have better classes each year during this time. So our expectation should be that we should see an increase in the graduation rates associated with that better class. And we're seeing that to some degree, as we should, in our six-year graduation figures. But we're not seeing it in our four-year graduation figures. You can see it's really remained pretty remarkably flat. So I think we need to do a better job of helping students graduate in four years. I recognize that not every student wants to graduate in four years, but there's a lot of good reasons to finish in four. Uh, one, obviously, is the money you save by not being enrolled in extra semesters. Clearly, that's a savings for students uh, and for families. As the job market is improving, more jobs are, are available now, it gives you the opportunity to get out in the job market faster. Being on track to finish in four, also gives you the opportunity potentially to do one of our five-year programs where you would get a master's degree as well as a bachelor's degree. So there's many reasons to finish in four, and I think we want to see a culture on Stony Brook that encourages students to think about finishing in four. Do that, we have to do some things on our end. It's really important, uh, I think, that we make sure that all the class sections are available for students that they need. Part of the promise we made from SUNY 2020 was that with more faculty, we'd have to be able to teach more sections to be able to offer more courses, to make sure that students have the credits they need, can take the courses they need to graduate on time. That's really important. That's something we'll be working with the faculty with, but that, I think, is one of the key things. We also, I think, need to make sure that students don't pull out because of financial issues. So one of the challenges we've heard, and we've had students come to the financial aid office, some of whom are absolutely maxed out on their current financial aid. They can't get more, and they run into some financial hiccup. Something happens. There may be short $500 or $1,000. A family member becomes sick. A car needs repair. And they're not able to stay in at that moment in time. So to address that, we've come up with a plan that we're going to initiate uh, starting uh, this year, a finish in four fund. We're going to put $250,000 into it initially in the pilot form. It will be available to students in good standing. They should have maxed out the financial aid they're eligible. So that could be our most economically disadvantaged students, but that could also be middle class students who are filling the squeeze that the middle class is filling. So they may have exhausted their personal resources, their family resources. They may have exhausted any financial aid or loans they're eligible for, and they may still have a gap. We want to help them as well. We think it's help them, important to help them stay on track. So it, we want to keep them from having to withdraw from a semester. We, want to, we will make sure when we fund these dollars that they're on track for graduation. They'll prepare a plan for how they plan to graduate in four. But we think this will help them uh, reach the finish line and succeed. And I'm excited about this program. And I want to thank Matt Whalen, uh, Charlie Robbins, and Braden House, who've been very much involved in putting that together. And thank them. I also want to talk about teaching, and very briefly. Obviously, our education mission is at the core of what we do at Stony Brook University. And I think all of us, as educators, uh, want to do that job the best way we can. And one of the things I think that we need to focus more on is doing better job with online learning at Stony Brook. We've made some important new initiatives. I think we really have some great new courses that are being developed, but the scope and scale I think is not enough to address some of the issues we have, particularly in things like graduation rates, classroom availability and resources. All of those things, I think, are driving us to do a better job with online learning. And for many students, it really is a way in which they learn better. Online or hybrid courses work better for a number of our students, and we need to, we need to face that. So in collaboration with uh, our provost, Dennis Asanis, 
We're starting an initiative. We're going to devote a million dollars over the next four years. Um, we are going to create a grant program, an award program essentially for faculty um, who are developing uh, new uh, courses. We'll make awards of ten dollars to $50,000 per year. This is going to tie in with some other initiatives we have uh, as part of a, a new SUNY 2020 initiative. The goal of the program really is to leverage online approaches and new technologies to better support uh, our educational mission. We're going to give preference to proposals that will demonstrate innovation, that will help be models for other faculty in developing uh, new online courses. We're going to give preference to proposals that are designed to enhance teaching to our large enrollment gateway classes. So these are the classes that many students have to take. They're often things that hold up students' progress. We want to make sure that these are being taught in the most effective way possible. And then we'll give preference to proposals that are designed to enhance student success, again, measured by improved graduation rates. So this program is going to start right away. We are going to put an RFP out, a request for proposals um, from faculty. But Dennis and I really look forward to working with each and every one of our faculty members to help you develop courses that we think will help improve education at Stony Brook University. So I want to end up and spend the most time, the last, let's say, uh, 10 minutes, um, talking about research uh, and the challenges we face uh, in research at Stony Brook and really across the country. So federal support of, of research has transformed the U.S. and the world really since the end of World War II. The world has really been transformed by federal support of research. I've put up here a number of products, the Google search engine. Watson is an example of a supercomputer. The MRI, which of course was developed by Paul Lauterbur at Stony Brook University. The internet, speech recognition, uh, as well as touch screens, uh, GPS. All of these came from federal funding of university or national laboratory research. That's where all of these technologies came from. Federal funding of US universities or national laboratory research. That's extraordinary, this level of innovation. And in terms of health, my special interest, uh, the impact in some sense may be even more staggering. The death rates for heart disease in the United States are down 60% in the past 50 years. Think about that for a second. Deaths from heart attacks are down 50%, 60% in the past 50 years. That's a result of NIH funding of research on how to treat heart disease, how to understand the epidemiology of heart disease so you can prevent heart disease, new drugs that both prevent and treat disease, new surgical techniques that treat those who have it. All of that from NIH-sponsored research and all of that impacting all of us uh, in this room. Childhood cancers, childhood leukemias used to have almost a uniformly, used to be almost uniformly fatal. Now the survival rate for childhood cancers is now more than 90%. Again, that's research uh, over the past uh, 50 years. While deaths from cancer as a whole are falling about 1% per year. That's not as fast as we'd like, and there's work to be done, but it tells you the kind of impact uh, that we can have. HIV, something I'm experienced with. When I was caring for HIV patients in the 80s, Patients in their 20s had an average life expectancy in months. Not years, but months. Now, we expect a patient newly diagnosed will have a life expectancy uh, in excess of 70 years uh, with our current therapies. Again, the first drugs, the first innovations all came from federally sponsored research through NIH. So, I think if you were running a business, frankly, and you looked at that and you said, what has been the return on that investment in terms of innovation, in terms of driving the economy, in terms of people's health, you might say, wow, that's worked pretty well. We should invest more in it. Um, that hasn't happened. Instead, the investment from our government, uh, really since 2005, has been a pullback, essentially, in support um, for research. And that's shown here as you look at the growth in investments in research and development compared to many other nations. We're comparing now the change in gross domestic expenditures, GDE, on research and development as a percentage of the gross domestic product from 2001 to 2011. And what you can see is the United States is near the bottom in our spending. I'm glad we're not Canada. Um, you know, I say that a lot, actually. No, no, no. No, no offense to people from Canada. I'm, I'm kidding. Um, I'm glad we're not Canada. But, you know, look at Korea and look at China who really has a very significant GDP. So when China is growing at this rate, that's an incredibly 
in incredible increase in their investment in research and development. Denmark, Germany, many countries in the EU, all of them are making the investment because they've seen what investment has done for the United States. They've seen what investment in research, the difference it's made to our economy and the quality of life worldwide. So they're now making the same kinds of investments at a time in which we're really pulling back. And this just shows each of the agencies that are important for funding Stony Brook University. This is the NIH. You can see a peak here in 2003 and then a decline since then. Um, the same thing, NSF is really pretty flat. It's had a slight increase, but really pretty flat. Um, mild, uh, moderate increases uh, in DOE. Um, NASA really down from its peak. So in all agencies that are important to Stony Brook, there's been a pullback uh, in support. And this just shows it for NIH again, and I think this is pretty striking. If we had simply just increased NIH funding from 2003, at the rate, medical research rate of inflation, um, the current budget should be about $36 billion as opposed to the $33 billion it was. Um, instead, we're at about $28 billion now. So we're down about $5 billion in terms of funding. Um, that makes a tremendous difference in our infrastructure. It makes a tremendous difference in our ability to attract scientists into this field. If they don't think federal government is going to support research, young scientists say, why should I enter? the research field, it really detracts from everything I think we're trying to do as a country. And the overall gap is about $38 billion. So this is our expenditures by federal sponsors. And I'd say, you know, overall, it's a disappointing slide for us. This is, uh, this is grouped according to these different sponsors. You can see them down here. The bottom one is NIH. That's our largest sponsor. Um, then NSF is second, and I'll let you read these other colors yourself. But just look at the aggregate impact. Um, we haven't had much in the way of significant growth since 2003. We actually probably peaked around 2005. There's an impact here of the American uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act, era funds that perch it up, but we're really not moving at the state we need. So some of that is obviously a result of those cuts uh, in federal funding. That obviously has an impact on our ability to attract dollars. But it's not just that, and I think there's more that we need to do um, to help Stony Brook. So what do we need to do? Well, first of all, we need to advocate better before Congress uh, and the White House. We need to do a better job of going forward and telling the story I was just trying to tell you and tell the public about how important it is uh, to support federal, to how important it is that your tax dollars go to support federally sponsored research. Um, Alan Alda, as you know, is uh, now directing our Center for Communicating Science. He is at the forefront of helping to get that message across, of helping to train our graduate students, our postdocs, and our faculty how to communicate what they're doing in science to help build the excitement in the public about this venture, about what we do, and help again, ultimately help attract more resources into this very important uh, endeavor. We also need to bust red tape, essentially, both on our campus and nationally. I'm on a panel right now uh, that, on AAU that's looking at ways in which we can reduce federal red tape. I was in a panel discussion with the president of Yale University. They said that they're currently spending about $24 million a year just to be in compliance with federal regulations on their research. So think of that, just $24 million a year, just devoted to compliance on federal regulations. I don't think we're spending that much at Stony Brook, but we're spending a considerable amount to do that. A number of these things are absolutely necessary. We have to make sure research is conducted in the absolutely most ethical uh, and correct way possible. But on the other hand, there are also dictates that come down that frankly don't make sense, things that really we don't see any benefit both for the agencies or for us, and we need to get some of those things eliminated or altered. We also need to make sure at Stony Brook University, and, and David Conover and I have had a number of discussions about this, that we're not putting undue burdens on researchers as well in terms of compliance and red tape, and we'll continue to work to pare that down so our research can be more efficient. Right now our researchers in some cases are spending 25 or more percent of their time just preparing grants because of the way the system works, and we need to find ways in the agencies do to reduce that time commitment also, give them more time to focus on science, and so we can also spend more money on science. We also need to remove barriers to collaborations. I think the new building we talked about, the MART, that would bring cancer researchers together with cancer clinicians is one example of a way to break down those barriers. We need to break down the barriers across Nichols Road. We need to break down the barriers to collaborations with campuses, other campuses in SUNY. And we need to reduce the barriers to collaboration with industry as well at Stony Brook. Make it easier 
for our researchers to do research, to develop collaborations, and to help them be more successful. More and more large grants are the coin of the realm for agencies like the National Institutes of Health and NIH and NSF. We need to be competitive for those, and many of them are multidisciplinary, including involving the behavioral and social sciences. So we need to find ways to get people engaged in this uh, better and to make collaborations easier for our faculty. And finally, we need to support and mentor our young faculty. So for the new faculty you're here, we need to support and mentor them, help them get that first grant, help them write that first grant. It took me a long time, actually, as I think as a PI, to learn how to write a good NIH grant. I think by the time I was probably 15 years into my career, I think I was pretty good at it. But I think it took about that amount of time. It took time for me to be on the study sections that review grants, to understand the criteria, and that helped me. We need to translate that experience to our young investigators sooner to make them more competitive. So we have challenges, obstacles, if you will. But are they insurmountable? Absolutely not. I think we can, we can overcome these. I think we can be on the trajectory that all of us want to be on as we move Stony Brook forward. I think, as I said before, overall the state of the university is very, very strong. And I'm really optimistic about our future. And one of the things that makes me most optimistic is something I alluded to in the, in the past. is the fact if you look at our new faculty that we hired from the 2011-2012 uh, academic year to the present, their total awarded funding, so I'm talking about the total dollars that they've uh, been able to bring in, is now close to $70 million across campuses. So these new faculty are already making a very positive impact in our research. We need to support them, mentor them, help them to continue to succeed. We need to make sure the new faculty here today also succeed. Uh, all of this will help us as we drive to improve what's happening at Stony Brook. So that concludes my talk. I want to thank you all for attending today. And you're all invited to attend a reception immediately following at Stalo Plaza. Thank you very much. Thank you.